good evening everyone and a really warm welcome to the second part of our online induction course. We're just passing that midpoint of the term so I hope this next 45 minutes gives you some much needed time to just stop and pause and reflect in what is a very busy time of year. Today we'll hear about De La Salle and how he fell for education. And leading us today is Emma Biggins, Director of St Cassian's Pastoral Centre, and myself, um, I'm Jo Malay, and I'm Director of Formation and Vocation Ministry. We'll begin our time today with a short prayer. Let us remember that we're in the holy presence of God, and let us adore him. We may not always be able to see ahead in everything God is doing. We may not always understand his ways or timing, but we can be confident of this. He is at work. God, with you there is no darkness. Your character has no shadows and you are pure and good. Yet in our broken world, we see so much darkness around us. Pain, sickness and disease are in our community and in many of our homes. Bring your light and restoring presence to the dark places in our lives. Bring your heart hope to hearts that feel defeated. Bring your love and compassion to those in pain. Give us faith to say, Lord, you light my lamp. My God illuminates my darkness. May your light of hope shine in the darkness for families today. Show us glimpses of your presence with us and the comfort you bring. In the busyness of today, help us to take a moment to be still and sit with you, to slow down, breathe deeply and release our burdens to your strong hand. You are trustworthy, good and true and we thank you for caring for us so deeply and beautifully. Open our eyes to see you at work today. It was your light. Amen. Live Jesus in our hearts forever. So thanks, Joe. Um, I'll get started. Uh, as Joe said, I'm Emma Biggins, and I've been at St Cassian's uh, Retreat Centre in Kimbury for uh, just over ten years, um, and. The centre is in a little village that's about an hour away from London uh, in the south of England. Um, so Joe and I are leading you through the session today and it's split into two parts. I'll be taking you through the first part and then Joe uh, will take over. We're going to be taking you through some of the key elements of the founding story and hopefully sharing how something that began many centuries ago still has relevance to us today. So my job is to give you a flavour of the life of De La Salle, who he was, where he came from, and how did he become our founder? There's a lot to the story of John Baptist De La Salle, and in the 10 minutes I have, I'm only gonna be able to just scratch the surface. So, first off, De La Salle was born in France on the 30th of April in 1651, in the city of Reims, and he was the eldest of seven children. His father was Monsieur Louis de la Salle and his mother, Nicole Moet. And the more eagle-eyed amongst you will have spotted the bottles of champagne. Yes, she is from that very family. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get discounts on those bottles just by flashing our Salle in badge, but I live in hope. Um, being from a wealthy family also meant that de la Salle was well-educated. College de Bon Enfant was the school de la Salle attended after having private tutors when educated at home. There was a lot expected of John Baptiste. As the eldest of seven siblings, a lot was resting on his shoulders. The De La Salle family lived within this area of the city of Reims. In fact, all of his childhood was within this mile radius. His school, the cathedral, his mother's family home, even the Archbishop's palace, all of it almost within touching distance of each other. All of De La Salle's life was in this safe space. 
in a well-to-do area of the city of Reims. Whilst only 15, he received the canonry of Reims Cathedral and was ordained into the priesthood at the age of 27. The cathedral was central to life for De La Salle in his upbringing. He was very happy to be part of the church and living a very comfortable life. So De La Salle was set for life. His road was mapped out for him, priesthood, wealth, a very comfortable lifestyle, and that's how it went for a while. But a chance meeting on a doorstep changed the course of history for De La Salle and for educators everywhere. An opportunistic meeting on the doorstep of the Sisters of the Child Jesus between Adrian Niel and John Baptiste De La Salle led to De La Salle being asked to set up schools for poor boys in the city. At that time in France, you had to pay for your education, which ruled out many boys who went without any schooling at all. De La Salle had, decide, had to decide whether to commit to helping this man who confronted him on the doorstep or continue along the path set out for him. Just to put De La Salle's situation in contact, context, a little bit of background information. His parents had died within a year of each other in 1671 and 72. This meant that De La Salle had to execute his father's will, manage the family finances, assume the role of head of the household, be guardian of his brothers and sisters, all the while carrying on his studies and following his path into priesthood. Adrian Niel was the catalyst to the work that De La Salle then undertook. He'd had no inclination previously to open schools or become a teacher. He'd had no desire to run schools for boys. But he soon recognised that there was a need at that time for schools for those who would usually miss out because they couldn't afford it. So this chance meeting on a doorstep led to De La Salle becoming involved not only in the opening of the schools, but he also went on to invest his time and his money into how they ran. His acceptance that opening the school was God's will led him to accepting eventually that he needed to be fully involved in the project. After a while, De La Salle recognised he needed to be more hands-on and would need to take on the running of the schools. It was clear that the schoolmasters needed instruction and that he would need to step in. This led him taking on the role of teacher and mentor to those men involved in the education of the boys. He even went as far as inviting the schoolmasters into his house, a move that would have been unheard of, especially as he was still head of the family and responsible for his brothers and sisters. He moved out of his comfort zone, quite literally, out of the safe red zone and into the poorer area of Reims. In 1683, he responded to a further need. At a time of severe famine, he gave away all his possessions and wealth to feed the poor in the winter of 1683. This shocked the schoolmasters and his own family even more. But what it proved was that De La Salle believed wholeheartedly in a project that had begun on a doorstep, but soon snowballed into a new education style and one that continues to influence even today. He had a path laid out for him from being very young. He'd always wanted to be a priest and he couldn't have foreseen the steps along his journey that would change the course of his life completely. He'd never intended to become a teacher but he found himself in charge of schools, teachers and students at a time of great need. A challenge that he rose to and consequently dedicated his life to. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that it was all plain sailing for De La Salle, that he met Adrian Yell on the doorstep, agreed, opened the schools and everything was rosy. If you read more into his story, you uncover that he faced many objections to what he was doing. Free education was unheard of, and he upset many people and made many enemies. But for today, this is where we'll leave the history books on De La Salle. One thing that struck me when I first heard his story was that it all could have been so very different. A real sliding doors moment. One meeting, on a doorstep, an invitation, a request for help, a response to a need, 
led De La Salle down a whole different path, a journey into a life that he could not have foreseen. One yes led to a commitment that led to another yes, another commitment, and so on. Something I think that many of us can relate to today. So that's my bit done. A flying visit through the, some of the key moments of the life of De La Salle that leads us to where we find ourselves today. I'm now gonna hand over to Joe, who'll delve a little deeper into the story. Thanks, Emma. So today we've heard about the journey of De La Salle, the transitions and the transformations that he went through and those key moments which changed the course of De La Salle's life to become the mission that we all share today. It seems right to begin in this important moment. The moment when De La Salle was asked by Adrian Neal to set up free school for poor boys, a request that diverted De La Salle onto a new course, but one filled with purpose, grit and determination. A purpose and passion so strong that it still continues over 300 years later. We'll all probably experience or have experienced the notion of one commitment leading to another without us really being aware of it. For instance, we're all here working in education. We all have different roles. We bring who we are to the position that we hold. And sometimes it's only when you step back for a moment and you, you look and you think, wow, that job that I had when I was 18 led to the next thing, to the next thing, until we are all here today. One commitment leads to another, and then before you know it, you're so woven deeply into the work that you do and those that you serve that you can't ever see a different way. De La Salle experienced this, and in one of his meditations says, God, who directs all with wisdom and moderation, and who does not force the will of men, wishing to have me completely occupied with the care of the schools, involved me unexpectedly, and over a long period of time, so that one commitment led to another without me being aware of it. In other meditations, De La Salle does say, indeed, if I'd ever thought that the care I was taking of the schoolmasters out of pure charity would have made it my duty to live with them, I would have dropped the whole project. But just as De La Salle knew all those years ago, and we know today, that once you start to work with young people, once you start to build those relationships and touch those hearts, there's no going back. No one went into education to deal with the effects of a global pandemic, but one commitment leads to another to mean that we are the adults helping to ensure that the schools run well, that our children are educated and that they are safe. One commitment leads to another so that before we know it, we are the fabric of our schools and centres, and ultimately the Lasallian mission. From the very beginning, De La Salle was all about responding to needs of the time. And this is certainly a thread that weaves right through the Lasallian story over the past 300 years or so. The concept of the popular tu tuition free school um, open to all was not original to De La Salle. His real originality lay in his administrative skills, in providing schools with dedicated and trained teachers, in his recognition that teaching was a true vocation for the laymen of the church. After his death in 1719, the dynamism of his thought was translated into action by new generations of brothers and continually adapted to respond to new situations. De La Salle would tell the brothers that what was needed was a teacher whose demeanour was both firm and gentle, who conveyed a sense of affection for their students. He also warned them that the main reason for a student to stay off school or to truant was down to a lack of relationship with the teacher, that the teacher didn't try to win them over having a face like a prison door. Put simply, De La Salle urged his teachers to love their students and to find ways to win their hearts. De La Salle often said that it was important to find the right balance between having the firmness of a father and the tenderness of a mother and to individualise learning but to use correction and praise which best suited the child. 
If you have the firmness of a father towards them in order to pull them away from disorder, you must also have the tenderness of a mother to put in order to protect them and do all that is good for them. So in establishing schools back in the 17th century, De La Salle was very forward thinking, empathetic and responsive to the specific needs of the time. And although he was relationship centered, he needed to consider ways in which to correct a child. His advice to brothers would be to avoid at all costs demeaning the child, individualized correction in light of the student and in light of the offense. De La Salle's vision for education was rooted in the gospel and he understood clearly that telling a child that God loves them isn't enough. Young people need to be shown God's love and it's through the school and the relationship with the teacher that this love is shown. In responding to needs, De La Salle recognised that there were consequences to the deprived lives of some of the poorest children of that time. He saw that there were three main causes of maladjustment, and they were disturbed emotional relationships in families, lack of a role model and value system, and parental neglect. And in order to combat these factors that were present in so many of the children's lives, De La Salle would say it was down to the example that the school and the teachers provide to be the change that was needed in their lives. And these are all factors, I'm sure you'll agree, that are still prevalent today as barriers to learning and to keep, keeping children safe in education. De La Salle fell for education because he could see just how transformative it was on the young people that he and the schools served. By providing free education, he was and promoting relationships and empathetic, person-centered teaching, he was able to develop a lifelong mission has inspired and transformed education to be the mission that still holds true today. Education that remembers that at the, at, at the heart of it are human beings, people with real feelings and experiences that are essentially the image and likeness of God is a powerful form of education. And taking this lead from St. John Baptist de La Salle and living this out every day, that's how we experience our La Salian mission is how we share the Lasallian mission and ultimately become the Lasallian mission for future generations. So that concludes our input today. And we now have a few questions for you to continue to reflect on in small groups. So taking the theme a little bit further now, it's to think about how did you get involved in education in the first place? You might be here as a new teacher, or you may be an experienced teacher who now finds himself in a Lasallian school. What brought you to education in the first place? And then thinking about that theme of one commitment leading to another, have you ever experienced that? Can you look back and see a sort of joining up of dots along the way, which has meant that you're here today? And then also, how do you build and how does your school build positive relationships, both with the staff and with the students? So we're going to place you in breakout groups for a little while. A um, couple of questions there for you to think about. And then when we get back, if anyone is, is willing to share, then we can have a, a, a minute or two with that. Okay. All right, then. So see you in about 15, 20 minutes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. I hope you uh, uh, enjoyed your time in small group. We've got a few minutes before we uh, finish. And so just wanted to give you uh, the opportunity if you wanted to share any thoughts uh, from your small group or anybody got any comments on what they've heard this afternoon. Um, if you are, uh, if you would like to, then please raise raise your virtual hand and uh, unmute yourself and uh, we'll, we'll try and hear some feedback from people if you want to say something. Jane, I can see your hand up. Thank you, yes. Jane. If you'd like to, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I was just um, wanted to thank um, you all. It's always marvellous to actually meet other people from other schools. And uh, the wonderful group that I was fortunate enough to, to be in 
we were saying how marvellous it was to um, be part of such a huge community. And um, I, for one, I know several of the other people that, that mentioned it as well, didn't realise quite how many Salian schools there were. And actually the school I work at, St Edwards, is actually an associate school. So, and it's just a real privilege to know that there are other people out there and um, to know that that uh, um, solidarity and the comradeship and, and, you know, the love is basically being being spread in, in all those different parts of the world. It's just tremendous. And I find it quite a humbling experience to be working at a, a Salian Associate School, but I'm enjoying every moment of it. So thank you. Thanks, Jane. It's true, isn't it? When you when you suddenly realise how big a network you're part of, it can be quite like, wow, I didn't, <laughs> I really didn't realise that. And it's it's reassuring, but kind of overwhelming at the same time. But thank, thank thanks, you. Jane. Thank you. Anybody else? I can't believe we've got all these shy teachers. I really, I really don't believe it. I can, Linda, I can see Linda waving at me. Hi everyone. Hi. Um, um, yeah, I think for us in our group, um, I had we had a chat about sort of our journey to to work in in the Lasallian school, and I think a couple of things just resonated with me. And people spoke about the words passion and enthusiasm. And Andrew, who's in Malta, um, is is just said similar to what James just mentioned there about the fact that he wasn't he was overwhelmed really by the size of the organization and you know that connectivity bringing us together it, it's a really powerful platform and something that we really all need to tap into and these these opportunities are fantastic these evenings because then it allows us just to network to get to know each other and set up some you know group networks between whether it's subjects or to do with the Lasallian core values maybe going forward that's something we, we could think about yeah, thank, actually, I think sharing sharing ideas of how things work in school and and having little gatherings like this online, you know, four to five minutes, you know, is is enough for us, isn't it? Really, to be able to make make that kind of contact and those relationships. So, uh, you know, that's great to hear. Thanks, thanks, Linda. I, I don't want to put off anybody else who's you know building up the courage to speak uh, to us all, but um, we do want to finish at, at quarter two. So. Um, Last chance, anybody, if you've got any words of wisdom to share with us, and if not, I'm going to hand back to Joe. But um, again, th you know, thank, thanks everyone for sharing. I think it's over to you, Joe. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for being here and for being present to one another. And today we've looked at De La Salle, his life, how he's ended up in education. And next time we'll start to look at some of the key characteristics um, of being a Lasallian school. So we'll look in particular at the five core principles and to facilitate that session, we'll hear from two colleagues from De La Salle Dundalk in Ireland. So they will talk through how they use those and some examples of what, what they do. So the next session is in January. So for now, thank you very much. You know, enjoy the rest of the term, have a great break when it comes as well. Um, and we'll see you all soon. Okay, thank you. It's not too early to wish everyone Merry Christmas, is it, Joe? Surely. Surely it's not. <laughs> <laughs> See you in January, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Merry Christmas.